revivalist preacher in here, so if anyone, if I start speaking in tongues or if anyone wants to, you know, be healed at any stage, we can probably arrange that for you. Blood defiles us. Blood makes us sacred. The cyclical crises of transformation are the province of magic, of sex. As Camille Paglia wrote, we must reclaim the whore of Babylon. But what of the male approach to this? The answer must not be written, not in the mother's milk of the ecriture feminine, but in blood. The male body does not bleed, but claims an inviolability, an ever constant erection. So my approach has been to find a masculinity that does not pretend to be hewn from granite, but which partakes of this same process of flux. The flow of blood into the cup of the beloved is a constant affirmation, the state of nature, and is not limited to the more dramatic sanguinous acts I will be discussing. To give the full ritual formula, whose ultimate injunction is that every drop of blood returns to the grail, requires an acknowledgement of our troubled ritual history of blood, and further invites us to apply this understanding to all of our actions, whether we aspire to sainthood or tread the path to power. My concern in the first half of this essay is to address the blood rights of men constellated around modification and sacrifice, and drawn for the penumbra of the BDSM, transgressive, and queer subcultures that shared space with the occult underground, particularly in the period of the 80s. Through our experiments, magicians were very much at the forefront of the sexual revolution. And what I wish to suggest is that it was the practitioners of magic whose ritual actions have brought to tooing, piercing, and other sexualities into culture. The extent to which these forms of modification have been commodified, I will deal with in my concluding remarks. In rejecting the parlor games and the very much moribund magical scene, the body was used as a sexual ground of performed difference against a backdrop of Cold War and hard politics. A youth movement that was both proud and outlaw opposed Operation Spanner, AIDS, Section 28, vivisection, fur, and the state, inspired in particular by the examples of Topi and the modern primitives. We all took up the knife and the needle, and as a generation of magicians, we chose to transform ourselves. This was where authenticity and magic was sought, not in nostalgia, not in tradition, and not in pedantry. It is a very important and under-acknowledged part of our magical history. And the period was characterized by tools and techniques that still very much have utility, which is why I'm introducing them again at this trans States conference. Though much of the text that the period produced um, very much has the worm in the page, I don't advise we all go back to writing like Genesis Peorage. <laughs> sorry, sorry, uh, devotees out there. As a conscious agent of change, I asked myself, what is the nature of the erotic magical landscape? And how can it be worked as a site of power? Special clothing, jewelry, and jargons were not enough. Whereas the use of piercing, of penetration, opens up the body into the kind of singing wound mysticism that so influenced William Blake, or arguably Yukio Mishima. Unlike the mirror neuron, reaction we get from studying uh, the Pieta or the crucifixion. Witchcraft and magic choose to intervene directly in the body. They directly inscribe it. So I ask, what does it mean to bear stigmata, to be pricked with the mark of Cain, of the devil? And why is this not at the heart of our magical practice? What shamanizing can we possibly engage in without crisis and ordeal? I like to use shamanizing in academic conferences to see who flinches. <laughs> <laughs> I 
ear piercing is very often a, a first rite of passage and something that members of pretty straight society have. And as a visible marking, it declares you to your peer group in society. But the cartilage that you're working with has very little sensation. What I found in my own research is, is there needs to be a central nervous system response in order to achieve either a reset or a magical result. We need to be transformed. Or as my martial arts instructor would say, it works because it hurts. God, I still remember some of that. Needles teach one very important aspect of this, which I choose to call point. The trick to mastering point is given by the Marquis de Sade in his exemplary works, Juliette and Justine. And the answer he gives is that everything is simply sensation. And overwhelming sensations have no moral status. It is our reaction to them which defines their meaning and value. We have the agency. We have the choice. Point, as exemplified by the needle, teaches presence in the moment, presence in the body, and at the same time, annihilation. Again, to defer to the divine marquee, point has the advantage that it cannot be faked. Whether glyphed as Baphomet or Mercury or Dionysus, fluidity has always been an important magical attribute. Hence the title of this presentation, Becoming No Man, from Nemo, the name used by Odysseus in his outwitting of the Cyclops, Polyphemus, and inserted as a cut-up into Crowley's Waratah Blossoms, wherein he says of Babylon, no man may come nigh unto her. Such an engagement with koans, riddles, and poetry is a vital component of magic, and it is desirable that we all reach our own conclusions as a result of our lived experiences and our exploration of our corporeal truths. So in my 20s, I set out to disrupt the erotic hierarchy of the male body. Since a teenager, I've been wearing makeup and cross-dressing and all the other things that subculture kids would do. But what I wanted to do was to change from being the penetrator to being the penetrated and to shift my sexual response from what is typical in men to be anchored in the genitals to a wider understanding of the body. And so by piercing my nipples, I formally altered my relationship with my erotic body and with my erotic dreamscape. My body was no longer to be considered as strictly male. And in an energetic sense, in dream and in ritual and spirit contact, I could begin to pass as no man. The next change that I undertook was inevitably genital. Performed in the circle with full ritual, I submitted to the needle. And with a flower of startlingly red blood, I did what is forbidden in straight patriarchy and wounded the phallus. This was a full ritual scorpionic working for Babylon. Another point ritual, but one which has permanently altered my erotic topography, rather than being a temporary action, such as the insertion of needles um, for, for a spell, um, which can sometimes be enough. Point is uh, a very important thing to master, and needles are the best tool that I've found for this. As with the famous erotocomatose lucidity states, it's the oceanic total body state that follows in, much, in which much of the actual magical work is done. But first you have to pass through the eye of the needle, and many people cannot breach the, uh, the, the dermal taboo. So through, through the ritual, the male body is no longer seen as a closed story, but is experienced as a state of transformation. And as a heterosexual man working with the mysteries of Babylon, such blood offerings are a key to the pylon of her mysteries. The body speaks, and it says, I am made of my mother's blood. I cannot contain it forever. The marrow flows out of my bones as sanguine and semen and is drunk by my lover. I die in pouring out my offerings. This is, if you will, the male formula, which is death. And it is the practice of annihilation that men need. 
rather than clinging to the Victorian fallacy of the will, the vigilized sigil, or whatever other phylactery is used to avoid facing the loss of the self in the beloved. This is the death meditation of the lover, whose symbols are always the skull and the rose, and whose ordeal is symbolized by the black box. Points, of course, can be extended by permanent piercings or heightened through the use of larger tools. The sheer size of the insertion of hooks for pulling or suspension into flight is a radical experience that combines the shock of insertion with a powerful and prolonged myofascial release. Fakir Musafar was the pioneer in this field who inspired me and many others. Um, drawing on particularly the Okipa ritual of the, uh, the Sundance ritual of the Plains Indians, um, Fakir worked with a, a flesh pulling technique wherein two, uh, two large five millimeter hooks are placed through the chest um, and then you statically pull. In the original Okipa ritual, you pull until the piercings tear out, um, which are done traditionally with eagle claws, but in a modification context, you're not gonna pull out these hooks. Um, uh, although you try. The advantage of using hooks is that they teach duration and they merit repetition. And as a technique, they have great magical utility. So what's become of increasing interest to me is this combination of annihilation and duration. Perhaps as a result of my age that I'm not simply catastrophic in my approaches, but it's also a male energetic requirement to work with longevity rather than just pushing the fight flight triggers. A further consideration of duration is that that's exactly what our bodies are built for, um, particularly in the running down of fleet-footed prey. We are built for it. Duration asks a lot more for us ritually as well than a simple flash of bravado. And we learn also that adrenaline runs out typically in 20 minutes. So the final piece of personal ordeal work I'll give um, concerns this. I received a full ritual scarification um, cutting to my chest. And I could tell when the adrenaline had gone because the uh, ring on my hand was knocking on the floor with an unconscious shaking response. Um, which is a very interesting state to go through as the body resets from trauma. What's interesting about cutting is that rather than uh, tattooing, where you tend to go into a, a nice kind of bliss state, the scalpel continues to disrupt you. It teaches you that there is no good place to find. There is no sweet spot. You have to confront the realities of the body and it is in these confrontations as much as getting out of the body that much magic is found. Magic is not simply the accumulation of scars and ink, but also a process of healing. Yet blood must be spilt. So that's the confessional first half. There's a more fundamental question to be asked. What is the nature of initiation and a blood ritual in particular? And there are two traditional forms of blood rite, the blood rite of women and the blood rite of men. That of women is concerned with menstruation and the passage into womanhood and is bound to the lunar cycle of renewal. Menstrual blood is universally taboo and supremely powerful magical substance whether we study the medieval tantras, the Aboriginal people of Australia, or the work of modern sex magicians, the most complete record of which is given by Peter Redgrove of Penelope Shuttle, whose work remains underrepresented within the magical community. And I have to give a simple um, warning here. Um, celebrating the mysteries of life as given by biological women does not mean that I'm denying other mysteries, genders, or proclivities. So if there are any snowflakes on YouTube listening to this, please don't be too offended. <laughs> Another aspect of blood rites, that of expiation, such as the sin offering in Leviticus, the crucifixion, and the goat offering in the red dragon and the grand grimoire, 
I've discussed previously and will do so again in Lucifer Praxis. But as an aside, Plato's Phaedrus, read as a myth of Christ by Clement and the Church Fathers, suggests that sacrifice can resist, result in immortality, in perpetual communion with the deity to whom the sacrifice is made. And here I add to the Christian martyrs who Clement infers the example of Jack Parsons, whose immolation can only be understood in these terms. The blood rites of men traditionally are those of hunting and killing. In the cave, the spear and the phallus are covalent, as is menstrual blood and the blood of the animal. In the timing of the hunt, the lighting and extinguishing of the hearth fire, these are all tied to the moon and the synchronized or performed synchrony of menstruation, accentuated with cosmetic displays of reddening. Such a symbol system is still found in the remaining hunter-gardener societies. The ritual action is that of penetration, menstruation, and renewal in a passage of return to the first time when humans and animals were mixed. It enables rebalancing of the community and in the sex strike aspect, simply no meat, no sex, it enforces the not eating your own kill taboo. As Chris, Chris Knight and the Radical Anthropology Group have eloquently argued, these are lunar and menstrual mysteries from our earliest history. The male mysteries are therefore originally subordinate to those of women and the lunar cycle which controls both the hunt and the flow of blood. This is the witchcraft that I follow, as it is the course of our species and a corporeal matter of fact. It is the deep structure to be found in my apocalyptic witchcraft. In the male mysteries, there's another subset of blood rites which parallel the female mysteries, where the male initiate bleeds, perhaps with a sub-incision or a circumcision or a stick is thrown up, thrust into the nasal cavity. This is a way to magically usurp the power of menstrual blood and to deny the special status of women. The phallus gains not only equivalence, but superiority, because it both bleeds and ejaculates. For theorists of patriarchy, this is the moment of the male coup. The hunter's society secrets develop into a baptism of blood that secretly binds men to one another and takes precedence over the female bloodline, as with the practice of exogamy that removes women from their family and kin group. Blood is therefore a form of baptism magically used to transform the loyalty of men from their mothers to the dominant male or males who may also take a new or secret magical name at this time, an exact parallel to the way that modern Masan Masonically derived occult orders function. This patrilineal function of blood rites has been um, expounded in the academic work of Nancy Jay in her Throughout Your Generations Forever. This killing rite and the male conquest of female power were combined into the state cult, where animal sacrifice to the predominantly male god was rebaptism not into the cult of the familial dead, but of the state cult. Our loyalty is passed over to Rome. Our citizenship is not our shared kin. In an extension of this, men have consistently used magic to claim that they are entirely self-created. Crowley's Mass of the Phoenix is the most famous and prevalent blood rite to be considered in this way. The initiate is renewed by their own substance. No menstrual blood, no women, just men. Crowley insists this through all his problematic magical work and all his religious proclamations, with creative energy being entirely male and women as inert dead elements with no soul who can only help to be reborn as men. Small problem there. So as a male magician with a grounding in Philema, my aim has been not to mistake, make these same mistaken meanings although some of my actions partake of the outer forms. For example, my genital modification does not make me the equal of a biological woman. My bleeding does not replace menstruation. I am becoming no man, Nemo, a child of the goddess. My allegiance, as ritually enacted, is to the first order, that of my mother's blood, which cannot be washed away. I am mindful of who owns my blood, of who gave it to me in communion. And that transfusion is the formula of Babylon, 
for men who choose or are chosen to work with her. So we have a challenge. Sacrifice creates community. But how does this descriptor match my ritual actions performed for the most part in private? I'd argue that my blood ordeal signals my abdication from a community, patriarchal society, Judeo-Christianity, neoliberal capitalism, civilization et al, and my membership of a third column, which is both a counterculture and critically a community of spirits. Without the element of spirit contact, these actions are only personally meaningful or storying, as for example, most people's tattoos are. My experience as a practitioner is that they've changed my erotic topography and therefore my relationship to the spirit ecology. In magical terms, I can pass. As I'm virtually out of time, I will point out that there's uh, significant parallels between the work that I do um, and the examples of Tantra, particularly the earlier forms of Tantra um, as, as uh, being exposed by the work of David Gordon White, who's the most important uh, tantric writer for modern practitioners to read rather than the earlier, the Mukos material. Um, and the tantric hero, um, the tantric hero in a particular rite that I'll just give quickly, the 10th century Kuchi Kamata, the practitioner draws bloody yantras, pierces their body, offers their semen, blood, skin, marrow, bone, flesh, and fat to the yoginis, who miraculously bring him back together and gift him with the supernatural power of supreme knowledge. This should be a core of Western magical practice. I'll cut there. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, so take some questions, please. OK, is anyone putting their hands up? OK, excellent. I was kind of, I'll come back. Thank you. You said that your practices, you feel a connection with the ancient Tantra rituals. But in my understanding, ancient Tantra wasn't about subversion of patriarchy, but was about keeping it all the same and kind of letting it out in a small ritual context. How do you feel about that? Um, it's my answer. I'm, I'm not a, a neo-Tantra. Um, what, I, what I find is interesting is the, the, the parallels between, between particularly the earlier Tantric material and uh, rather than the later medieval Tantric material and the, the physical technologies that we have in the West um, and that we magically practice. So I'm not, I'm not, I think it's, I think it's, there are significant, there are significant parallels which are useful for us to draw from, um, particularly because we all share the same physical technology. We same, share the same corporeal technology um, and how we choose to then use and direct that energy. Certainly, as I gave with the Crowley example, you can, you can have a completely patriarchal meaning behind your blood rituals. Um, but you can also you can also reframe them and magic is magic is all about getting power and directing power. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Okay. Did you have your hand up? Yeah. Thanks for a great paper. I, I think there's a real tension in your paper that a lot of us deal with um, and I wonder how you resolve it because you say that uh, and it's absolutely necessary in order, you know, to enter into the a becoming is to de-majoritarianize yourself. Um, but at the same time, we're still dealing with issues of femininity and masculinity, and you tried to deconstruct the fetishization of women, which I thought is crucial and really important in your paper. And yet, we're still hearing words like masculinity and heterosexual. And I just wondered, and it maybe even mirrors the tension that we have in kind of um, uh, post-human or what I call a-human studies, where we're trying to go beyond gender and beyond sexuality, and yet sometimes we're utilizing or even potentially fetishizing indigenous practices or ancient practices, whatever. So it kind of um, relates back to the first question as well. And I mean, it's a, it's a tension. It's such a difficult tension. I think yeah. politically it's really important. So what you're doing, I think, is great. But how do you, in your work, how do you navigate that tension between the maintenance of signifying systems and categories 
and the actual becoming a body without organs and going beyond gender and sexuality. What, what's really interesting about it is um, uh, I'm, I'm quite rare to be a, um, a heterosexual magician. Um, it's, I, I'm actually quite a minority with my group. Um, but what, what I've found is that the, the queer subcultures and magical subcultures have always been together. They've, they've been together throughout my life. I, you know, I've, I've, I've spent most of my, most of my, most of my life with a, with, a, with, a, with a wide selection of sexualities in magical practice. So what I do is I try to talk about my own personal experiences. I don't believe that gender is toxic. Um, I don't believe that masculinity in itself is toxic either. Um, although I know that there are there are arguments for that, it's it's not my experience, uh, and it's not my approach. What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to present the technology so that people can find their own approaches to it. Whether there are approaches which are saying that um, that are working towards an abolition of gender, or whether there are approaches which are saying that we don't need to abolish gender, um, the technology is there for us to use in a, in a number of valencies. Um, but I have. I have no problem with with being male gendered, and I think that there are I think there are problems in many of the new approaches to gender that are being put forward that are in fact being quite destructive to the magical community in terms of turning individuals against one another, um, which has never been the case until this point. I hope that kind of answers your question. We can talk we can talk about it. Okay, thank you. We've got time for one more. Does somebody? Yeah. Hello, thank you for your talk, it was wonderful. Um, would you suggest that the point of bloodletting, you reach a state of tantric meditation, would you state that the ritual of bloodletting reaches states that you wouldn't normally reach without doing that? You reach, um, you, you certainly, you're certainly able to reach a single point of state with, um, with, with point-based ritual, um, which, is, which is very useful. People very often aren't in their bodies. There's a, there's a complete absence of physical culture. Well, I was going to talk about that. I'll, I'll publish my paper online um, because I go on and, and talk about the, the, the loss of body and culture and the loss of physical practice in, in magical culture in particular. Um, yes, they're, they're analog they are analogous to those states. They're, and they are, they're a physical technology which works with, yeah, yes, I have, yeah. God, I hope not. <laughs> um, as as a magician, I'm 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 I'm, I'm driven by I'm driven by a variety of things. Most most importantly, from the tantra tradition, I'm driven by power. I'm driven by achieving certain ends. So the use of point ritual in particular is useful for for magic, which is working to a particular end. Um, in terms of transforming on an ongoing transformation of an understanding of my body and space and 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 entity and topography, yes. Sorry, we're, we're really we're sure. running out of time, sorry. Okay, uh, brilliant, thank you very much, Peter. Lovely, thank you.